Hello, aspirants. Looking at current affairs for 26th March, the news items picked up from the Hindu newspaper are these 12. We'll look at them in detail. The first one, Lalu gets 14 years in fourth father's camp. So this is regarding RJD, Rashtriya Janta Dal Chief Lalu Prasad Yadav. He has been accused in father's camps. There are six father's camp cases against him. He has already been sentenced in three and now in the fourth case, the sentencing has been announced by the special CBI court, which was hearing the matter. So he has been sentenced to 14 years in prison. Seven years are under IPC, Indian Penal Code, and seven years are under Prevention of Corruption Act. So this is also the highest punishment announced so far. So it's not just the imprisonment of 14 years, but also fine of rupees 60 lakh has been imposed on him. So in this case, he has been connect, convicted with 18 others. Means these 18 have been you know, found guilty and 12 others have been acquitted. They have been left scot free, which includes former Bihar Chief Minister Jagannath Mishra. So this was the case. This was the fourth fodder scams case in which the sentence has been announced. It is regarding fraudulent withdrawal of 3.13 crore from Dumka, now in Jharkhand Treasury. So this is from the Dumka Treasury, Treasury, between 1991 to 1996 when Lalu Prasad was the chief minister of the whole Bihar. Jharkhand became a separate state out of Bihar in the year 2000. So from 1991 to 1996, in the five years when he was chief minister, 3.13 crore was withdrawn by fraud for, you know, for the, uh, as such, for the uh, scheme. So this is the fodder scam case of Dunga Trilogy. So here you can see the details given as such too. He has been convicted in four of the six cases related to fodder scam. We had seen earlier too, Lalu Prasad had asked that this is double geopardy. He has been convicted in the same matter again and again. There are six cases going on, but then the judiciary ruled that these are separate cases because the same fraud has been committed, but again and again. So that is why it's, it's not the same matter. So here you can see the various convictions so far. He has been sentenced to five years jail term in 2013. And then in 2017, another 3.5 year jail term came. In Jan 2018, five year jail term. And now a 14 year jail term. In the four cases in which sentence has been announced. There are six cases in all. Five are in present day Jharkhand and one in Bihar. So you can see the Chaibasa tragedy, Yoga tragedy cases, convictions have taken place. Dumka we saw presently. And these are the cases too. The next is, we are alert in Doklam, says Defense Minister. So Union Defense Minister Nirmala Sitharaman has said that we are ready, India is ready for any eventuality in Doklam. Doklam was the region where the conflict took place between India and China, though it is a disputed territory between China and Bhutan. And China claims it that Doklam belongs to it. It was actually undertaking construction activities, infrastructure activities here. And on that, India intervened on behalf of Bhutan. So this is a Doklam region here. So even uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi and the Chinese, his, his Chinese counterpart would be meeting at the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit, SCO Summit. India has recently become member of SCO, Shanghai Cooperation Organization along with Pakistan. So from 6, the membership has increased to 8 for SCO and the summit is being held. This was in 2017 that they were admitted as members and now the next summit is going to be held in China. So here in June 2018, the PM would meet his Chinese counterpart too. So Doklam standoff took place again in 2017 and the uh, Chinese military has actually, it is claimed, has altered the status quo. So it was a disputed territory, nobody should intervene, but since China initiated construction activities here, that resulted in alteration of status quo. That is what Indian ambassador to China has stated. So here you can see this is the Doklam region. So here this is Nepal, Sikkim is between Nepal and Bhutan. So this is the Bhutan territory. So this is the region. This is the Nathula Pass from India into China and India claims that this Doklam plateau is very close to the chicken's neck to the Siliguri corridor which is from West Bengal this is entire Sikkim has border with West Bengal state as such so this is the region through which mainland India is connected to northeast 
So this is called strategically important region by India. And here you can see the details of the Duklam dispute are given of 2017. So it's a tri-junction area near the Chumbi Valley under Chinese control. Bhutan claims sovereignty over it. And since China actually initiated a construction activities here, so uh, Indian army bunker in Sikkim was removed by China. And then China alleged that Indian troops had entered the Chinese side of Doklam. And India objected to the road being built by China near this tri-junction region. So this was the issue that time even Kailash Mansur or pilgrims were moving through the Nathula Pass. This entry was also blocked by China for them. And this is regarding SCO, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which presently has eight members, China, Russia, and the Central Asian states of Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan, along with India and Pakistan as the latest entrants in 2017. So other okay, uh, observers and occasional attendance, attendees and observers are shown. So now Shanghai Cooperation Organization is a eight nation group. It's a security alliance as such, which was founded in 1996 as Shanghai Five. And then when Uzbekistan joined in 2001, it became the SCO, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. This, you can see the goals and objectives and structure details are given here. Then next is Northeast ex-militants get more SOPs. So this is regarding ex-militants from Northeast India. So here the stipend for them, monthly stipend for them has been increased from 3,500 to 6,000 per month. Also the one-time grant which is provided to them has been increased from 1.5 lakh to 4 lakh. So this is after several requests came from the government of Assam. So it has seen a, the most number of surrenders and outlay of this scheme is the maximum in this region. So, Union Home Ministry has ensured that the state government which gives these stipends will be reimbursed. So, the entire amount paid to the surrendered militants by the state government would be reimbursed. So, this is a scheme of the government, security related expenditure scheme. So, under this, the reimbursement would be provided. So this is the announcement which has been made presently. So, for the first time since 1998, Ministry of Home Affairs has increased monthly stipend for surrendered militants in Northeast India. So the idea is that these militants surrender, come they are rehabilitated under the scheme so that they are uh, the misguided youth are weaned away from hardcore militancy in this region. So here you can see the number of militants who have given up arms as such shown here too. So from 2012 you can see the numbers of militants who have surrendered. Till in 2018, presently, so far, three militants have surrendered in the Northeast. So, the one time grant is also provided, which can be used as a collateral so that they can avail loans for self employment. So, this one time grant has also been increased to 4 lakh rupees. Then, next is GSAT 6A to give armed forces a shot in the arm. So, GSAT 6A, which is predominantly an S-band communication satellite, will be launched by ISRO on the GSLV rocket in on March 29. So, it will complement the GSAT 6 satellite, which has been orbiting since August 2015. So, this S-band satellite, GSAT 6A, is a 2000 kg class satellite, which has cost about 270 crore rupees. And it, this is more than a routine communication satellite because it is designated for the use of the armed forces and will not add any transponder capacity for general uses. Also, a special feature here is a 6 meter wide umbrella like antenna. So, this antenna is thrice as broad as the antennas generally used in ISRO satellites. So, this will enable mobile communication because the antenna is wide and then enable mobile communication from anywhere via handheld ground terminals. It should be beneficial for the armed forces. Otherwise, regular communication satellites have smaller antennas and they require much larger ground stations. And they can, these can this uh, GSAT 6A will allow even ground terminals, handheld ground terminals to be used. So, this S-band antenna has been developed by ISRO Space Application Center in Ahmedabad. 
So here you see the details provided. So it's a high powered S band communication satellite with a mission life of 10 years designated to be used by the armed forces. So it's an umbrella like antenna, so it will be unfold as such. You can see it opened up. Then next is bands told to be vigilant on Aadhaar. So UIDAI has now Unique Identification Authority of India, which is the head authority in on Aadhaar. It has asked banks to provide Aadhaar-based OTP for opening bank accounts only in the presence of customers in the banking outlet. Because presently it has been used by various banks, commercial banks are using it for opening up bank accounts. The person can sit at home and open a bank account through Aadhaar. So Aadhaar based OTP is used for verification. But now UIDI has said that this should not be done because its misuse of Aadhaar has also been seen while opening accounts. So this is a huge blow to banks which have been heavily dependent on Aadhaar based OTP authentication process for account opening. So this is actually has actually resulted in customers increasing for banks, various accounts being opened for banks. Even according to RBI norms also, if OTP authentication is used, then there are limits for the accounts. Because if such accounts are open, then deposits cannot exceed rupees 1 lakh and full KYC. Know, I, know your customer requirements is required to be submitted as such. So the submission of documents and biometric details should be done in a year. But now UITA has said that this cannot be done, uh, you know, OTP can be done. This can be done only in the presence of the customer in the banking outlet. So this is the order here. So UIDA has given cases of instances of misuse of Aadhaar in such cases. It has said that there have been instances where Aadhaar of person A got seeded with person B's account. Carry out fraudulent transactions. Even stolen Aadhaar copies have been used to open bank accounts and obtain credit and debit cards. So to ensure that such frauds do not take place, the UIDA has given this direction to banks. Then next is government calls for public responses to draft defense policy. So the draft defense policy has been made public and the government calls for public response on this policy, draft policy, which will be finalized after that. So this policy calls for creation of 30 lakh jobs and a total turnover in defense goods to be of 1.7 lakh crore by 2025. Also, this will require an additional investment of nearly 70,000 crores. So, this it hopes to achieve even rupees 35,000 crore in defense goods and services exports by 2025. So, make in India is being promoted. India to become a global leader in cyberspace and artificial intelligence technologies is also expected. So, even a suggestion is to further liberalize FDI in defense by permitting 74% FDI and the automatic route. Presently, it is 49% and the automatic route. So this is also a provision, a proposal under the draft policy. Vision is to make India among the top five countries in the world in aerospace and defense industries. And this is through active participation of public and private sector enterprises in the country, achieving self-reliance and also meeting the demands of friendly countries in defense goods. So even we wish to reduce our current dependence on imports and also bring in self-reliance in development and manufacture of various defense equipments. So this is the draft defense policy. Majorly the provision is regarding increasing FDI and also increasing domestic production, make in India. Then next is set aside disinvestment procedures for sick PSU's revival panel. So this is a parliamentary panel as such, which has recommended that the, a defined portion of proceeds from disinvestments of state-owned enterprises should be used for funding revival, restructuring and modernization proposals of sick PSUs. So whenever disinvestment is done, a section has to be kept aside. So government has target of raising 80,000 crores in 2018-19 by selling stakes in state enterprises. So even strategic disinvestment of 24 central public sector undertakings. Strategic disinvestment means where the government is a strategic partner. Means having more than 50% stake, the government will reduce its stake to less than 50%. So that is called strategic disinvestment. So even strategic disinvestment of 24 CPSCs 
general public sector enterprises is on the agenda so when this is being done including privatization of air india this is the suggestion from a parliamentary panel so even niti ayog is preparing a list of six psus that can be privatized so parliamentary standing committee on industry this has given this opinion that when this investment is done then there are various aspects which need to be taken into consideration that they are if they are especially for those that are profit making the government should give consideration to the jobs which are supported by such public sector undertakings the track record of their contribution to national economy even their capital expenditure creation potential as such has to be looked into and even the role in balancing the socio regional fabric so this is the And if six PSUs can be revived through this uh, this investment, then it would be beneficial for the country. The next is Panagaria makes strong case for privatization of public sector banks. So this is former Niti Aayog Vice Chairman Arvind Panagaria, who is currently a professor of economics in Columbia University. He has made a strong case for privatization of public sector banks in the country, with the exception of State Bank of India. So he says that there are so many scandals going on. The non-performing assets which are there in public sector banks. This this requires privatization of banks because they are more efficient and productive. Also, it is said that with respect to priority sector lending obligations, to public sector banks have not fared so well as the private sector banks. They often perform better than public sector banks in delivering these obligations. To is a statement given by Mr. Arvind Panagari. So he calls for. this investment so he calls for privatization of public sector banks then next is promise to farmers will be kept pm so this is the prime minister narendra modi's response to the allegations which have been put forth by swaraj india president yogendra yadav he has accused prime minister narendra modi of sponsoring looting of farmers by failing to ensure that they get the minimum support price so the farmers have been guaranteed minimum support price of at least 150% means 50% above the cost of the production so at least 50% profit would be there is what has been ensured but then this is not actually achieved so government when it is making such a guarantee so the farmers looking at the msp being so high they begin the sowing so at least expecting that at least they would get 50% profit but farmers fail to get that much and in such cases government must intervene is the demand made by mr yogendra yadav and the prime minister has ensured through his man ki baat that this this promise to farmers will be kept this these are the details even there is a complete article in the newspaper that why do farmers go marching so all the problems which agriculture faces and why they face such problems and what is the ground scenario regarding msp ko is the msp is to is detailed in this article which is very important so we'll discuss this so the question been asked is why are indian farmers perpetually in revolt so we are seeing farmers revolt across various states even in maharashtra recent farmers march to mumbai where they traveled around 180 kilometers on foot and reached mumbai the capital of maharashtra so bringing in their demands as such so the question been asked is why are the farmers revolting so over the years central governments have allocated ever rising sums towards procurement input subsidies and rural employment schemes even states have given loan waivers um, quite often still we are seeing farmers are not happy farmers problems have not been solved so because it is said probably these schemes are not addressing the right set of problems so what are these problems we are looking at it so the first aspect is from shortage to plenty so basically historically agricultural distress in india was regarding monsoons when monsoons are bad then there are input shortages and the yields are not good and that results in the farmers suffering but in recent years it is seen that there is surplus output but the prices are unremunerated so because there is high output so then when there is a market surplus so the prices which the farmers receive are very low and this is because of which the farmers income is affected in recent years so this is a huge concern presently earlier the farmers concerns were regarding yields not being good 
So even consumption examples are given of various uh, agricultural commodities like rice. So it is said from 1998-99 to 2009-10 in this one decade, the agricultural prices as the rice uh, you know, production as such was at 85 million tons to 95 million tons. But then consumption was around 80 to 90 million tons. So the shortage is more frequent than surpluses. But then from 2011 on 12 onwards, it is increasing to 105 million tons and has remained above 100 million tons in the last six years. In 2016-17 too, it was 110 million tons. But the offtake remains the same. The requirement is of 90 million tons only. So there is excess stock in the market. So because of this, the farmers receive unremunerative prices. Even wheat, it is said the same story is there for wheat also. Wheat, we have even import of wheat being done because domestic demand is more than the supply. So on an average, yearly average uh, production of wheat is 75 million tons up to 2010-11 and the, uh, even presently it is 94 million tons and the requirement is of 97 to 98 million tons domestic demand. So domestic demand is also being almost fulfilled by the supply of uh, wheat, the production of wheat. So here this is the point that even wholesale wheat prices have now been coming closer because wheat also is, the production has increased. So earlier also in respect to pulses also we have seen recently about wheat imports also that government still imports wheat. Though even wheat production in the country is increasing though there is a very small shortage. Then even which will also be overcome in few years is expected. Then with respect to even pulses. So there are severe shortages of pulses in India but in recent years we have seen even pulses production has dramatically increased. So, record pulse crops came in 2017 of 23 million tons. So, when there are surpluses, then the then since the supply is more, then the price is cold. So, this is the problem which is being seen in all these crops, including commercial crops like sugarcane and tea also. Fruit and vegetable farmers have other concerns also because they have highly perishable produce. So, though the production here has also increased, like potato production has doubled, tomato has even tripled, onion has increased fourfold in the last 15 years, but then there are poor storage facilities and that is why farmers also have to sell their produce in the local mandis only because of the state's laws, various states have their agricultural laws, APMC markets where the farmers have to sold, sell their produce. So, this results in their getting unremunerative prices. So this is one aspect of the problem, understanding the problem. Then next is driving the output. So agricultural output has been relatively high in recent years despite erratic monsoons. So it is said that even the drought seasons in recent years like 2014-15 droughts were less severe also. So we have been able to keep output high. One thing, even the centers MSPs have also been very high like we recently saw. In the budget also it was announced 1.5% MSP will be ensured, 50% more than the cost of production. So this MSPs also make the farmers uh, you know, see that the crops are attractive and they sow more of those crops and that we have high production. Also state governments, they have been competing with center for announcing bonuses and their own support prices. So of course then the farmers produce more of those products and the output increases. But then the profits are illusory. They are not real. Why is it so? Because MSPs over the years we have seen the governments have been announcing MSPs but farmers do not actually get those minimum support prices. Because market prices as such for many crops are much less than the official MSP for a very long period of time. The center announces MSPs for 24 crops. But the procurement which is done, so minimum support price is a minimum price which the central government ensures to farmers. So then the central government has to buy from the farmers at that price. But it cannot, cannot buy all the crops. Much, much of it goes in the market and the market prices remain low. And the farmers procurement as such which is done, procurement is by the Food Corporation of India is also restricted to just two crops, rice and wheat. Even NAFED, it has in, you know, brought in, it has also started procuring pulses. So that is it. For other 24 crops out of 24, 3 are covered. 
remaining 21 crops two msp is announced but then since there is no procurement and even state level procurement operations are ad hoc lacking funding direction so that results in farmers not getting the msp as such which is promised to them so there is really no guarantee that they will get the price which the which has been announced as the msp when they sell their products in the mandi so it's of no use the msp is being quite so this is the point being raised that the profits actually are illusory even in crops where central and state agencies are active and there is market intervention also there it is not they do not buy everything they are too selective and sporadic majority of the farmers are not benefited because of the msp for rice wheat and pulses also so even center has doubled up procurement in 2017 18 but still it is able to take up only one third of india's rice and only one uh, only one third of india's wheat also and one tenth of india's pulses remaining go to the market at market prices and market prices are prevailing and which are much lower than the msp so this is the point regarding msp has been highlighted of course it is appreciated that the present government has brought in policy fixes with respect to these problems also there is something which is initiated as a pilot project by the present nda government this is called price deficiency payments so in place of msps the price related losses with the farmers have that aspect will be given away as price deficiency payment so, all this is one initiative which has been taken also there is plan to replace input subsidies with direct cash transfers for farmers So this is being proposed. Even e-nam, electronic market, or national agriculture market, has been proposed. Even central government is pushing states to repeal their APMC acts, which prevent farmers from selling in markets of their choice. So these are some initiatives taken, which are appreciated. But the concerns are also there. You can see the points of concern. So one is the central central government aggressively uh, fights inflation. So when inflation fighting takes place. means prices should not go high food prices should not go high so in those cases what happens is then the, when the products seasonal spices uh, you know increase in prices take place of various agricultural commodities then the government increases uh, you know brings it restrictions so this results in the prices going low so then this uh, this actually inflation fighting results in farmers suffering they do not get good prices so this is the problem also with respect to trade policies the state policies of the government are also such that it will put huge duties so there are export taxes also put in that agricultural produce should stay in the country so that they are not exported so huge high export taxes as such also and even in some cases export bans result in farmers suffering because when this farm produce which can be exported and better gains can be achieved they are not So this is there, and also another problem is regarding the mandis. The mandis, with respect to APMC acts as such, also we saw the mandis. The farmers are forced to sell to the mandis only, and they rely on middlemen, which results in their profits being reduced drastically. So these are the problems with the farmers face. So even if market prices of crops are very low, then government does not take any step. It is helpless. cannot rescue them and if the prices are very high to government comes in and clamps down on the high prices so either way the farmers suffer so that is the point we made here it is shown you can see rice wheat oil seeds and pulses have been shown the production over the years from 1999 to 2017 1670 how the production as such has outputs have increased and this is regarding tea and sugar cane too and this is wholesale prices of these commodities so from 2013 to 2018 you can see the wholesale prices have not drastically increased over the years except for tur dal which goes a little high you can see here groundnut prices have actually gone down so when prices remain the same for so many years when all commodities have actually become so costly but food products which actually is been paid to farmers farmers are getting the profits out of it the prices here remain low so this is one problem and of course the middlemen should be eliminated so that farmers get directly get these profits so these are the points 
Then next is new vehicle scrappage policy may need tinkering. So the government has announced a vehicle scrappage policy now and in this policy vehicles older than 20 years will be eligible for the benefits under this. They will get a 50% waiver on excise duty, scrap value of the vehicle and also additional discounts from the original equipment manufacturer. So this policy has been cleared by the PMO and is awaiting approval of the GST council too. So it targets to take polluting vehicles out of the roads. And also when polluting vehicles will be scrapped out, then automobile industry will also have better sales. So this scheme is proposed to come into effect from 1st April 2020 when even BS6 norms will become applicable. But it is said that many medium and heavy commercial vehicles that typically have a life of 20 years will be benefited. But commercial vehicles, proportion of commercial vehicles over 20 years is very low and many of these are used in rural areas and small towns. So, they availing this scheme is very uh, low. The chances are very low. So, this scheme may not be very beneficial for them. Even under the draft vehicle scrappage policy, this period was of 15 years. But in the policy announced, it has been made 20 years. Vehicles older than 20 years are eligible. So, this is there. Then next is the last news item. Unmade in India, the story of Tirupur's decline. So this is regarding Tirupur, a city in Tamil Nadu, which is known as entrepreneur's paradise, where unskilled laborers arrive from across the country, they receive on-the-job training and they start their own micro small enterprises as such. So this is the largest knitwear export cluster of India. But in recent years, the young entrepreneurs here have been committing suicide. Many such cases have come forth. And what are the problems which they face are being discussed in this article. This is said to be both external and internal. Externally, they are facing competition from other exporters such as Bangladesh and Vietnam. And internal problems are that rupee appreciation which is taking place in recent years. So it's affecting the exporters and they cannot compete with low income countries such as Bangladesh. Also, Bangladesh has had treated a FTA with EU. So, they get the benefit out of it. Even Vietnam is negotiating an FTA with EU. It's already part of Trans-Pacific Partnership. So, these benefits which these countries get, the competitors get, India is lagging behind. So, that is a point being raised here. Apart from this, the other issue which they are facing is because of even implementation of GST. First, demonetization had affected them because of removal of liquidity from the market and then the GST implementation has resulted in the costs increasing, compliance requirements increasing and also the export incentives which they received have gone down plus the refund which the government had ensured that it will be done within 9 days they have not been refunded within uh, 90 days as such. So, But still it is said that they, they, that has not been done which is resulting in their liquidity crunch being faced. Even downstream processing units are suffering because they do not have enough liquidity, enough cash in hand to even buy downstream products because of which they are suffering. So this industry is suffering because of the implementation of GST, which is said to be in uh, uh, even the recent e-way bill, which has been announced again will add to the problems as such. So the largest cotton textile export cluster is being affected slowly because of badly implemented GST. It's a labor intensive industry, it generates 2,400 jobs per 1 crore of investment. So there is a need to intervene in this matter and that is being called for. So these are the news items. Thank you.